Hello everyone, welcome to the AIN Big Topics. I'm Paul Z. Jackson and we are delighted this week, this month, this year, this century, to have with us Andrew Drew Tarvin, who is going to lead today's session. Drew, over to you. And yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm excited to uh, to chat with you all today about uh, getting applied improv online, or essentially kind of the the intersection of improv and technology, and how we can uh, still take advantage of all the the pros and uh, benefits that we know of improvisation, but how we can take advantage of that in a more virtual world as we're increasingly doing remote events and that kind of thing. So that's going to be the focus for today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I do have uh, slides. I love me some slides, of course. Um, I'm going to share that. You should be seeing my screen now getting applied improv online. Are you able to see that? We good? All right, perfect. Um, cool. So this is kind of born out of uh, the breakout session that I did at the AIN conference um, uh, this past summer in Stony Brook. By show of hands, how many of you were there at that? Uh, right out. Okay, yeah, so each of those. Uh, yeah, so we're going to uh, cover a little bit of those uh, kind of core ideas, but then because we are in a virtual environment, uh, have the option to practice them, um, to do some of the things that we are talking about. And since we are um, small but mighty, we'll be able to do that in a um, uh, concise way without the, the breakout rooms coming. But, uh, um, you know, as I shared in Stony Brook, the, you know, starting point is a disclaimer to say that, uh, you know, I haven't figured out everything, right? This is just to say this is some things that I've been doing with some of the, the virtual side of things as well as uh, some ideas to play with. And we're just in those early phases. Uh, also from a presentation standpoint, I'm a big fan of when presenting, sharing small things that, you know, you maybe don't call attention to specifically, but as you read through the text, hopefully there is, you know, comedy within the text uh, there, but that's just the disclaimer. Um, and along those lines, you know, again, I'm not the only one exploring this um, Area. Certainly, there are people who are combining AI with improvisation from a performance standpoint. So, Improbotics is a group um, based in the UK and elsewhere where they are improvising on stage with AI, uh, with uh, different uh, chat by chat bots, etc. And in terms of creating art in that format, uh, also that there is a lot of um, improv already in a virtual environment, such as these apps that are all found on the App Store for, uh, you know, different things like, you know, the, the Sokio is just improv suggestion. So if you've ever run out of suggestions for a group, you can just go into the app and say, oh, I want a character or a um, occupation or something like that. So there's, there's other people that are exploring this improv and technology space. Um, we see that even within the Facebook group um, for the Applied Improv Network. If you do a search for virtual, you see quite a few people that are asking about, you know, as far back as 2014 of, hey, if I lead some uh, a virtual space, would people join or can we have this virtual playground, which is something that I think, you know, as an entire group, group we can continue to push for. The AI and, uh, uh, group is a fantastic place to be able to practice some of these things so that when we're working directly with clients, uh, we're not doing it for the very first time. Uh, so the agenda for us this morning or afternoon or evening or midnight hours, if you're watching this a little bit later, who knows, um, is uh, we're going to talk about why online as uh, an idea to explore um, three ways to start to incorporate the technology and then also give us a chance to, to practice a little bit. Um, so starting with uh, why online, um, this is uh, an opportunity that we can go into um, surveying tools. So within uh, Zoom, you can do surveys themselves, or you can also um, uh, just uh, do a like a web version of a tool, which I think I lost sharing. Let me share again. Um, so, for example, you can use a 
Um, app, this is the same one as uh, I went to for, uh, or that I used in person as well. So if you go into your browser to pull ev.com slash Andrew Tarvin 048, since you're sitting at your computer, or you can also text if you text Andrew Tarvin 048 to 22333, this might only work in the US. So, uh, Paul, I don't know that uh, it's going to work for you um, there, but you can text in or you can just go to the website. And this should be, let me make sure that this is activated now so that you can actually, no, now let me activate it. Now you should be able to um, vote. Are you able to do that either virtually or on your website? Yep, uh, able to, um, yeah, so you should see that as an option and then you can select A, B, C, D, or E. And so this is just one way, whether you are in person or virtually, that you can start to add a little bit more engagement, that you can find information out about uh, your group, either for if you're doing kind of an opening frame type exercise where you want to learn, okay, what do, what are people interested in? What should I focus on? You could do this as a way to vote on exercises to do or suggestions to use. If you'd like, there's a lot of different opportunity within uh, polling to create imp improv type uh, moments. Um, yeah, so we're starting to see those results there. Again, you can do this virtually or in person. Uh, the other thing, let's see, and I will see if I have the capability to actually do this. Uh, the other way that you can create kind of that engagement is you can do a, uh, you know, kind of the popular map, and I'm trying to see, let's see. Um, I don't know, let me see if I have this, these options, annotate. So you should be able to, um, on your screen, are you able to annotate as well? I think I can give that option to people. Uh, or if you click at the top of your screen, uh, you should see various options to um, annotate. Let me actually go back into full screen mode of this. Let me go up here, annotate. Um, Right. Are you all able to, do you have an annotate? Uh, yeah, so we see it, yeah. So you can mark on, you can do a popular like mark on a map, change a color, you can change it to a stamp um, and put a heart where you're like calling in from. Um, for example, I'm there in New York City. Um, uh, so you have kind of like simple interaction way uh, to, to keep people engaged um, from this standpoint. With the world map, it's a little bit harder to get more specific, but yeah, we see um, we've got the uh, Pacific Northwest, we've got uh, Doug there in Iowa, me in New York, and um, who is, I'm um, forgetting, Lisa, you're in Connecticut, is that right? No, Pamela, you're up kind of in the Northeast there. Uh, we have the multiple arrows from uh, uh, Paul, I like that, so you can give a uh, specific frameworks if you want. Hey, use an icon for this or draw this out or text it or, you know, type out uh, the ideas. So this is just another way to have some of that interaction from a, uh, a virtual setting. And then as a person controlling it, you can then uh, clear just your drawings, all drawings, you can change the format and then close things out. Um, so we've got an international group kind of uh, joining us and that's part of the value of a virtual environment is that you aren't limited to being in that one specific region. Uh, so that's one reason why we might put Applied Improv online, but we are also a smaller group and it is interactive. So I'd love to, um, I would love to share for, we have enough time for, for each person. So I'd love for each of you to kind of share why you're interested in getting Applied Improv online or why you're interested in intersecting uh, technology and virtual. And I can see each group. So we'll have uh, maybe Paul go first. Okay. Um, um... I'm already getting excited by the <laughs> technologies that you're showing us. Mm -hmm. um, I've taken opportunity of the chat as well. So one of the mm -hmm. things for AIN, we've got a worldwide membership, 7,000 plus people that 
would easily be able to participate in all sorts of online mm -hmm. things, even if they can't attend the annual conferences or even live events in their own regions and areas. Yeah, and absolutely. I think that, that mirrors clients as well. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Very cool. Uh, Pamela, you'll be up next. Uh, let's see. We you're unmuted. I see, but I don't know if I can, we can hear you. Try again. Okay. All right. There you Two go. Two things. One is I I teach our classes in a business school on leading creative collaboration, and so I'd like to help the people who take that class be able to do this stuff too, because they all work globally in corporations, and we use a lot of improv, and I want them to be doing more. So I'd like to translate this knowledge for them, but also in my consulting. I work with groups that have, um, you know, like start at the University of Arizona, but they are building a telescope in Chile and the teams have to work together. And so uh, doing leadership development work with them, I need this, this ability to be, have more fun on our, <laughs> in our leadership sessions and more interaction. Yep, that makes sense. Very cool. Uh, Doug, you are next. Yeah, and so I think I can also control that. I can unmute you, Doug, and I think it'll give you a request that do you want to be unmuted. Okay, cool. I couldn't find yeah. how to unmute myself. But yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, do not do not give my family that technology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my two interests are: first of all, I, uh, I do an improv for educators workshop, and for the first time, I've been asked if I would consider doing follow up mm. virtually. And on one sense, I thought. Uh, if I just kind of Skype with a teacher and talk to them, then I don't see how I add any value to anybody else who's an expert teacher. Mm -hmm. So I would still like to keep the flavor of the improv thing I do with the follow-up. And so that was interesting. And the other thing is I've been doing these great uh, workshops on uh, social nonsense, this collaborative creativity thing I do, but I live deep in the heart of darkest Iowa. <laughs> and realistically, there's a limit to how much I'm going to travel to do this. Mm -hmm. And I thought if I could uh, find a way to do it honestly and well virtually, then I can do it for uh, different populations. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that makes a lot of sense. All right, excellent. Thank you. And uh, Lisa. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, two things for me. One, the latest uh, project that I'm engaged is in is with the University of Washington. We're doing a finance transformation initiative. So it's a, a very large enterprise-wide project. Um, and our meetings often involve people who are both um, physically in the same place, but also dialed in remotely, whether it's mm -hmm. our stakeholders um, in various locations or people who uh, work full time on the on the project. So that's one thing. And then the other thing, um, I'm working on um, climate change collaboration and trying to help organizations uh, in, train up their folks to be able to um, engage in difficult conversations. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's going to probably involve a lot of people from different organizations. So having a way um, to have them connect. And I guess the third thing I'd say, um, I don't know about where other people live, but our city is becoming just more and more congested so that even if there are people who are physically relatively close by, um, more and more people are opting for some kind of an, an online option just because it's so hard to get around. So finding ways yeah. to make those interactions as, as robust as they could be. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And I think, um, yeah, and kind of to the climate change and the uh, even if you could technically go somewhere, people are starting to be more conscious of their carbon footprint. Um, and so thinking about how often do I want to be traveling and getting on a plane to different places, um, part of it might be that uh, there's a fee um, challenge, so maybe a, an organization can't pay you to fly to some place to then be able to work, but they're interested in the content. Um, but overall, it creates a lot more ability to create um, access. I think a couple of tips to, um, to keep in mind when presenting is, uh, one, the equipment. Uh, and so I don't know if this is true for other people, but Doug, just so you know, you're for coming through on my side, your, your microphone was a little bit kind of buzzy at certain times. And so if you are going to make um, virtual a big part of your 
uh, or you want it to be a part of your delivery, audio is incredibly important. And so typically you want something that isn't just the built-in audio of your computer and not just even the built-in audio of your headset from your phone. Um, oh, is that the microphone you're using? Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, this is the one I'm using right now. So this okay. is buzzy. For some reason, only on certain words, but it's a little bit buzzy. Um, okay. So it might be a connection of like take out the USB or something otherwise. Um, but um, that's good yeah, to know, though. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so sometimes like a, a headset can be helpful because you hear it all um, together. Also. Um, if, if you're doing podcasting and things, uh, the Blue Yeti microphone is very popular. It's a little bit higher end. It's in the, uh, like, I think it's 120 or something like that dollars. Um, and then also something that you can invest in is a pop screen. Um, and this is something for a microphone. So for certain like letters and things, it doesn't pop. When I'm doing a podcast, I'll use this. When I'm doing uh, a webinar, I'll use um, the headset a little bit, but just making sure that you have the equipment. Same thing can, I do know some people that prefer having an external webcam as opposed to having just their laptop webcam or that kind of thing, just because it maybe makes the, the, uh, the video a little bit crisper, but the technology is an important component of um, doing things virtually, as is having a backup plan. Uh, you know, the ideal is that, of course, everything work, works perfectly, but if you're going into a meeting, you want to make sure with the participants or with the meeting organizer, if something goes wrong, you have, you know, oh, okay, we're going to call, I'm going to call into this number and it's going to be, and I can just speak to it. So if I, if you can't see my slides, it's okay, I can still present that way or uh, that you're gonna reconnect. So these are just kind of small tips that as you're thinking about putting these together, some things to, to keep in mind. Uh, the other thing that I would uh, suggest, and we'll talk a little bit about this in the next session, is uh, ideally if you can have yourself as kind of the content provider and then someone else as a almost like technology moderator. You don't wanna be the person, if you're working with the client, you don't wanna be the one doing tech support. So if something does go wrong and someone's like, oh, I can't hear the audio, you don't want to be like, okay, well, everyone pause while I do that. Be like, you know, at the beginning of a meeting and set up, hey, if there are any issues, uh, chat, you know, email so-and-so or put it in the chat and so-and-so will respond to you. Um, and that just is a huge help in terms of, so you don't have to be distracted by that for that one person um, out of the many that you could be serving in that focus. Um, Cool. So yeah, I think there's a lot of exciting ways that we can we can use virtual um, and online. And so one of the things to kind of consider or keep in mind is that it doesn't even necessarily have to be for an entirely virtual experience. And so uh, you can use technology in live events as a way to enhance the live events that we already do when people are there in person. So you see this with groups like Comedy Sports playing the game text from last night where they get, you know, um, uh, text messages from, they get people's phones and read, they play basically actor's nightmare, but with a, a text message thread um, from people's phone in the audience. You could do the same thing with their Twitter feed if you wanted to, or, um, you know, some other form of, or their like Instagram photos or things. So you could use technology in the moment um, for f things like performance. Um, same thing with like Speechless Live using kind of uh, technology and, and giving um, uh, slides. So Speechless Live is a form of PowerPoint karaoke where people give a presentation based on slides that they've never seen before. And they get a suggestion from the audience. They specifically, Speechless Live does a wheel. So you don't even know what style of talk you're going to give. Maybe it's a TED style talk. Maybe it's a um, HR kind of onboarding video for, you know, the new company and you get a suggestion from that. What's also interesting is there's a, there's a guy who has taken this a little bit further where, um, he now has an app and I don't remember the website. I'll have to, I'll, um, uh, share it maybe in the, the Facebook group afterwards, but you can go to a website and it will automatically create a random slide deck for you pulled from images from around the web. So you don't even have to be the one that, you know, as if you're organizing the event, you don't necessarily have to be the one that like came up with these images. Now you can press the button and you get a random selection of different things that people then present, right? So you're using technology as part of the performance. 
And this, of course, could also be used if you're doing it a live workshop uh, or even a virtual workshop on, say, presentation skills, and you wanted to give people like, okay, um, you know, to practice your skills, take five minutes right now, and you're going to have to give a presentation on this thing, right? You're going to, they're going to build their skill set. Um, so not just for entertainment, but for the educational, the applied side of things um, that we do in, in this group. Um, you can also do in person, like, you know, we've seen this with um, games. This is, I think, kind of in some ways, I, the idea from uh, Doug with your, um, with restaurant improv, with, you know, being able to improvise anywhere is like, what are some games that you can just play for fun? If you think about the game Heads Up, it's essentially um, charades or um, word-based games that uh, has been put into an app form that you can now play with your friends. Uh, and it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun. So it's a, you know, um, there's, there's improv is, is part of this, um, this story. Um, and the other thing to think about is the, um, uh, the fact that everyone now in audiences have their phone when you are live. So most often we are thinking about ways of like, okay, how do we get them to stay off of their phones and put them on mute or that kind of thing? Especially with younger generations, a lot of people are going to be on their phone anyway. So how do you take advantage of that? Whether it is one, encouraging people to tweet or share, um, uh, and two, um, to take advantage of some of the technology pieces in that. Also, I am loving the um, the chat. Um, Doug, love the, the heads up. And yes, that is a Blackberry that this kid is holding. Uh, so it's a much older picture. But a uh, couple of the tools that you can think about uh, that every phone has now is one, a flashlight. So can you play with turning all the lights off in a room where you're doing a live in-person event and having them turn on the flashlight to discover things like, hey, how does that change your point of view or your perspective? Um, right, so you can use that as a, as a perspective exercise. Every group has a location um, as well. So for example, LinkedIn, you can encourage people to connect. In LinkedIn, they have Bluetooth-based um, finding of people. So you can go in and you could walk people through how to turn this on, how to select find nearby, and then immediately have all the people kind of connect with each other from a LinkedIn network perspective, right? Taking advantage of that, that location, or you could even set up um, a geocaching type um, scavenger hunt. So geocaching is based on uh, GPS where you put things in certain GPS locations, and then you give clues on how they get to that GPS location. Um, so rather than just a scavenger hunt of it's by a tree, you can make it even more specific if you wanted to use technology in that way. Uh, and then of course, also you have phones on, they all have a do not disturb mode. So you can always make a joke as a way to tell people to put their phones on do not disturb um, so that they don't interrupt you. The other thing is that they all have a voice recorder. And so as you are helping people do things, I'm a big believer in them being able to hear their own voice and how they do things. So for example, if you're teaching presentation skills, you can easily hit, say, hey, pull out your phone and uh, for this exercise, record you telling you know, another person your 60 second story of uh, answering the question of what do you do? Okay, now go back and play that back and here's a rubric to grade yourself for how you did. How many ums did you have or how many, you know, whatever it is that you're practicing or having them do, that voice recorder gives them something that they can take away. The advantage of something like that too is if you then do, so say you do that towards the beginning of, pre, of a presentation and then you do it at the end of the workshop as well and they have presumably gotten better over time um, over through your workshop because of the tips that you've shared, they also can now go back and listen to the difference and you can encourage them to do that. And just from a you know, delivery technique, that's sometimes helpful where people now see or visualize or recognize how far they've come in your workshop. So it helps them to solidify like, oh, wow, I have really learned a lot from this. Uh, I'm so much stronger as a presenter, you know, whatever, um, just from this one workshop. It just helps them to, to kind of capture that knowledge in their head a little bit more. Uh, in addition to a voice recorder, they also have all, all have timers. And so um, you can tell, you know, rather than just say, hey, do this for a certain period of time, you can say, okay, everyone take out their phone, put it on timer mode, set it for 60 seconds, put it on vibrate, and then now everyone hit go. And you have 60 seconds to do blank if you want to. Um, so you don't necessarily, I don't know necessarily the case where you always would 
do this, but it is a different way to, to think about using these, these techniques. Uh, and then finally, each one has a calculator as well. So you can walk them through different activities. So, uh, you know, I know one, um, uh, there's a, a fantastic uh, speaker named Neen James, and she, when she's talking with other speakers and they're trying to think about how they should set their fee, she has three different things to look at for setting fee. Um, but one of those things is she gives you a calculation and she's basically like, okay, think about how much money you want to make in a year. Okay, then think about how many weeks you want to work in a year. Divide the number of, or how many, say, presentations you want to do in a year. So if you want to make $100,000 um, in a year and you want to um, speak, uh, we'll say, 20 times a year, you can tell the person, okay, take out your phone, go to the calculator, you put that number in. So you put in 100,000, divide that by 20. That means your keynote fee or your workshop fee needs to be at least $5,000. Um, right, so you have them do the calculation so they're a little bit more engaged in that process. Uh, the other thing, just from that as a context, uh, that I think was very helpful for, for coming from Neen was saying, okay, that doesn't mean that every event that you're going to do is, say, $5,000 or whatever metric you put, but just recognize that that means that every fee, every event that you do that is lower than that fee, recognize that means that there's one more event that you have to do. So if you're saying, I want to do 20 in a year, but you do some for, say, only 1,000, that means you have to do at least 21, 22, 23. So now you're increasing the number of events that you're going to deliver. So it's just a, a numeric way to kind of play with that. But you can have the audience do that in that interactive way. And then I think the other thing that we don't often take advantage of is a camera. Uh, we, I've seen this a little bit with the Applied Improv uh, group. I think it was San Francisco where someone encouraged us all to take out our camera and take a quick video with the person next to you or a picture and then post it under a hashtag. That's a great way to, to create uh, images for whatever event that you're at or whatever hashtag that you have. But also in addition to that, you can take advantage of the fact that you have a camera roll, right? So if you think about um, – the game, I've, I learned it as photo album. I think I learned it from Pat Short, um, but where you have one person telling the story of a trip that they went on through an imaginary photo album, one person listening to that story and asking questions about it, and one person giving the storyteller math problems to solve. Um, and it's all about kind of how, how you deal with multitasking and um, distractions and all that kind of thing. Well, you know, you could replace the imaginary photo album with now, hey, open your um, phone up to an album that you would want to share with people and show the actual pictures or get to know you exercise of, okay, turn to the person next to you and uh, pick one picture from your photo, your photo roll and explain the story of that photo. Um, you could also do this in a virtual setting. Uh, with a smaller number of people, if you wanted to have each person, say, share their screen with the photo that they bring up or kind of show it, um, you know, to their camera, you could also do it that way um, from a virtual idea. But it's just taking advantage of the technology that we're all now so accustomed uh, to having. Uh, the other um, kind of component of bringing applied improv online, so that's, that's actually the live in person. So actually, let me pause there. And any questions? Uh, and if you have a question, kind of raise your hand real quick, and then I can unmute you uh, if you have a question or thoughts around the live in-person things. Anything, Doug? All right, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so I'm teaching a large lecture, and I've been using Poll Everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that, they, that you can do with Poll Everywhere that I think is very useful to what we do is you can give them a graph. Yeah. And so, for example, you could say risk avoidant, uh, risk embracing, uh, shy or quiet, you know, just basically two mm -hmm. different polls and then have people yep. click where they are. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, and, that's uh, a great idea. That works really well for a whole variety of things. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and Lisa, great question on the intersection. When you have some people that are in person and some that are virtual, I think that's probably the most challenging situation. Uh, if you have everyone virtual, that's easier because you know everyone is virtual and you manage that. If you have everyone in person, that's also easier when you have a little bit of a split. What tends to happen is putting a focus on the in-person attendees because they are the ones who you kind of get that immediate reaction from. They're the ones that are physically there. Um, and so I think 
Um, in terms of a couple of things to, to manage that, I think one, if you can find some way to see the virtual attendees, it can be helpful that you check in or at least have a camera, a set camera that you look to. As a presenter, I think, think of the camera as another audience member that you would check in with. So as you're making eye contact with people around the room, also be very conscious of making eye contact with the camera. One of the things that can help with that, it's silly, but um, I think it's, it's helped me in the past, is to put those uh, little googly eyes on the camera itself like put it near your webcam or on the camera there just because it is, and you'll see it and you'll maybe even kind of laugh to yourself as you see it each time, but it, it's just that kind of physical reminder to say, hey, look at this particular spot uh, as well. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that after the, the next section of, of maybe some ideas there. Um, but a, a couple of things to, to kind of just parse from uh, how we've been interacting so far is what's nice with Zoom and having video of each person is you can still do the normal things that we would do of like by show of hands, how many of you blank, right? Because you can still see that visually. I can still say, hey, raise your hand if you have a question and see it. Um, we can also interact through the, the chat. So if you think about what's really cool about, say, the difference between in-person and virtual is if you have a, a group um, or even within that group, you have more introverted people and they're less likely to kind of speak up in a group you can encourage them at the beginning, hey, anytime you have a question or a thought, share it in the chat. And that for some people feels a lot less kind of intimidating. And so you can actually in some ways gain more engagement from a virtual type setting from different personality types than a uh, in-person setting, depending on how you ask the, the, the questions and do things. Um, so yeah, we can take it, continue taking advantage of the, the chat and the um, virtual thing. So uh, when we think about on demand, um, I think sometimes, at least when I was first starting out, I was like, ah, oh, you can't really do interaction or that much stuff on demand, right? You have to, it has to be live in order for it to work. But we know from old, you know, uh, sweat into the oldies type videos that no, people will follow along to a video. Um, you can't have quite that same level of debrief, but we can still record some of the activities that we do. We can still speak to some of the, um, uh, you know, the takeaways from them. Um, but uh, it's not going to be quite the same, but it is still something that we can, can do. Uh, for example, uh, you know, Gary Ware, his uh, recent TEDx talk, he does uh, actually one of the same activities that uh, Tiagi did. Um, at Stony Brook with the whole kind of like, you know, rotate counterclockwise in the air and then bring it down and then like, look, is it still clockwise or whatever? And then from that in his talk, he debrief, he has the audience do it, but as a person sitting home, it's an easiest, easy enough one that you can follow and then you can still follow along in the debrief. Um, so you can do that in a both in-person and virtual environment uh, to kind of back to Lisa's point. You can still do activities like that that um, are an individual activity um, or you could even do it as a video. So one of the most popular videos on my on the humor that works the humor that works company YouTube page is a video of the game zombie tag. And over 500,000 people have viewed this and it's just kind of demonstrating the game zombie tag. Now, the big mistake that I made with this particular video, as you're thinking about videos and things as you go forward, two mistakes that I made. Uh, the first was that I used a, copy, a copyrighted song to make it sound more epic. Um, and so they didn't give me a copyright strike, but instead now ads roll on the video and I don't see any of that revenue. Um, and so the disadvantage to using, you know, non, non licensed material is that uh, one, if I wanted ads on it, I could be making money or two, even if I was like, ah, I don't want ads, I want people to just watch it and then hire, you know, humor that works. Um, I can't do that because I can't turn the ads off because I have copyrighted material in it. Uh, the bigger thing that I failed to do, and, uh, and this was, you know, uh, from a video perspective, and I see it in people's uh, speaker demos or their say their their workshop demos is I didn't show the debrief. I showed the fun of people walking around as a zombie and all of that, but that's maybe fun for some people. This, I think a lot of college students watch this video and then use it as an exercise or a lot of like camps and things. But if you're a, a company that's going to hire 
you know, an applied improviser and you don't see why they would then do this, then this just kind of seems like, oh, okay, well, there's a silly activity. Maybe it's fun, but what's the point? And so I think one of the opportunities that we have in the applied improv world is showing the applied piece a little bit more in our promotional materials, making sure that we are showing the debrief and showing the participants, not you being the smart one saying it, but showing the participants, you know, saying, oh, hey, what I recognized in this exercise was blank and having them say the things that the clients that hire you, what they say they want. If they say, oh, we want a more supportive team, if you're going to show a yes and video, don't just show them doing yes and, but show the debrief of them saying, oh, yes and felt a lot more supportive and I feel like I could use this, um, you know, in our, our everyday conversation. Um, uh, let's see. So Doug's question, are you talking about embedding this video in a context like this, a part of the Zoom meeting, oh, of showing a video? You could. Um, so the question of, you know, should you, should you show a video as part of the promo? Um, I think you could, the, the disadvantage to video in a webinar is that it doesn't always work well. Uh, does anyone here have any experience showing video in um, a Zoom call? Uh, I don't. I don't know how Zoom is. Go to webinar. You used to be able to upload resources beforehand that would then stream, would basically use the bandwidth on the person's computer. Um, I don't know if Zoom has that capability. My thought is that it would stream from your computer, in which case then it's got to upload to the Zoom servers and download to yours versus, you know, if it's a resource that's uploaded, then it's just based on your download speed. So that's a great question. It's one that I would, I would test a little bit more before doing it. I do know within Zoom, I can have it uh, choose whether or not I show audio uh, or share audio from my um, screen. Yes, Paul. I can't remember how much we did it, but we used a lot of different inputs in the participate program that AIM uh, okay. with the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center, which was an online program. We weren't mm -hmm. using Zoom. I think we were using a, one of the Adobe platforms. Oh, okay, um, yeah. Showing small bits of video was, was part of it, and I think it worked okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it can be okay. You don't want, it's again, another technical uh, technology potential issue. Um, and so it's just one to test a little bit more and it's all going to be based off of your, um, the technology that you use. Uh, I will say uh, when we were doing some webinar work with the PNG Alumni Association, we did some initial research and some outreach. And one of the things that they found was that, um, Slides plus video tends to create the most engagement, um, but slides and then if video where your mouth doesn't match the audio actually created less engagement than if you just have slides. And Zoom tends to be the best at this in far, as far as my experience. It tends to be the best at keeping your um, voice to your um, kind of the, the movement. Um, it does the video the best, I think. Um, but that's just another consideration to make when you're looking at the different tools to, to use is whether or not that comes across. And that's also going to be different for different people's bandwidth. If you're like, hey, I'm working with a group and they're all going to be in um, uh, their corporate offices where they have very good Wi-Fi or very good connections and all that, it'll be fine. Uh, that's one thing versus, oh, I'm going to be working with the, you know, the, the group is completely in a bunch of different countries. Some of them are going to be connecting through not so great uh, hotel Wi-Fi, uh, et cetera. Like then that's going to dictate maybe some of the things that you do because bandwidth um, from a data perspective is a, an important consideration on the virtual side of things. And the big thing with any client stuff is really to try to, to test some of these things. Uh, con continue on with the on-demand idea, certainly master classes, online courses, you can still have interaction where you kind of follow along. You can also give people assignments to do um, writing exercises as part of it. So again, it can be an on-demand experience where people still provide uh, content. Um, for example, you can also use this via forms. So if you have an online thing, you can even commit to um, hey, we're going to do an online course. If you submit, you're practicing, say, the story spine, go to this website. Um, you can then fill out the story spine and we'll give you feedback on it when it comes up, right? You can get a notification and then maybe you, you did the online course and you created it a year ago, but someone new joined 
and now you can still come back and give them feedback if you would like. The other thing that you, that you can do from an on-demand perspective that I've seen some groups do very well is even if it's a virtual training, a series of video courses and, and workshop things, is you can still have a class. So you can still say, hey, sign up, and we're going to all start on you know October 1st. We're all going to start and go through this, and then you have a Facebook group or a LinkedIn group where they all join and have conversations about it. So they watch the videos on their own, but then once a week, you have a check-in for people to then jump in and say, okay, how are you feeling? What did you think about you know, uh, this week's lesson? What was easy about? What was hard about it? Do you want to share some of the things that you learned? Right. So you can have that intersection of both kind of on-demand, um, where it's pre-recorded, as well as some live coaching, say, as part of it. Um, those types of groups, you tend to be able to um, sell at a premium as well because you have that hands-on experience. A, a set kind of just video course, if it's on Udemy, it's going to be less than 50 bucks. If you kind of self-host it, it might be, you know, a couple hundred, it might be kind of 500, maybe a thousand. Uh, once you get into like, hey, you're joining a group and, you know, I'm going to be joining every week to give feedback or you're going to have individual coaches, that's where you have a little bit more of a premium on that, uh, that offering typically. Um, you can also have it with, um, uh, you know, you have the improv games of, uh, of posting online, asking people to, to submit. This kind of happened by accident, but it's one of the things that I love about uh, the group of friends that I have on Facebook is that when I post a pun, which I love puns, now my friends use it as a prompt to post their own jokes about whatever that subject is. So, you know, I have a genetic predisposition to jogging. It runs in the family. So then people will join with their own, um, you know, coming strong out of the gate. Um, uh, that one will jog your memory, et cetera. This one is also pretty good. Um, the joke of up next, how to make sure your guitar is making the right sound. Stay tuned. Um, and then you have people sharing their own kind of jokes. My favorite is Mary Lee is uh, my 85 year old grandmother. Uh, and she had adds her own jokes. If you've seen my TEDx talk, then she used to kind of like uh, troll me a little bit, but now she's moved on to adding her own jokes, which I think is just, um, just delightful. So you, again, you can create this level of engagement where you're playing some of these kind of games, um, even in a virtual environment. And you see this on the um, uh, AIN network. People can share, um, you know, uh, this from Coco from back in 2013 did a round of I am a tree virtually in the AIN group. Um, you know, I've shared on my page of, okay, who's your favorite off-brand superhero? Here's the context. Here's a frame. Here are the rules. Come up with your own kind of ideas as a way for you to practice your skill. That's the whole focus of the Humor That Works Facebook community that we have is for people to be able to practice the skill of humor on a consistent basis, and it's all in a virtual environment, and they're logging in when they want to. Um, you've seen this also with um, uh, Twitter. You can do this with hashtags. So you can say, hey, go online and do uh, here, add your hashtags for misheard lyrics. And Jimmy Fallon has done this as part of a show, and then he reads them a little bit later. So you have that level of engagement if you want. You see YouTubers do this a decent amount as well. You're having YouTube people where they vote on the next subject, where it's like, hey, if they do typically a, a deep dive on a, a certain topic, um, or there's a group that does uh, epic rap battles in history, where they take historical characters and have them rap battle each other, then in the comments they say, who do you want to hear next? And that's a great way to create engagement. One of the nice things that it does, it creates a lot of comments on a YouTube video, which then increases within YouTube al algorithms to say, hey, this is a good video, you know, make sure you watch it. And it creates that level of engagement. And then from that, they take it and say, okay, this was the most, you know, requested person um, to do. So now Albert Einstein is going to rap against Abraham Lincoln or whatever. So it's, it's creating engagement, uh, again, in a, a virtual way. Uh, you can use uh, the various uh, voice assistants for different things. So you can simply say, you know, Alexa, uh, give me a random word. Um, and I've done that with each of these uh, voice assistants. These were the words that they gave me. Um, Google Assistant, I think, is, is trying to sound a little too smart. Uh, I don't even know what Mondegreen means, um, but uh, I like it as an idea, right? So it's just you can use the technology again um, to, to get suggestions, say, for, for yourself. 
Um, and then finally, for another on-demand thing, you're seeing um, seeing this a little bit more within um, uh, AI, the AI space, so the applied improv, but also the artificial intelligence uh, space. So, for example, one of my favorite examples of this is Botnik, which I should be able to show. If you go to botnik.org, you can pick what they say is a very, like a corpus. So let's say you want to, we can start completely from scratch. Um, you pick a voice. So what they've done is they have uploaded the works of a lot of different people um, to create a corpus. So for example, we can say, I'm trying to find a good example. We can say Britney Spears. So they have uploaded all of Britney Spears' uh, album uh, there, are, there are various albums and their lyrics, and so now you can write a song in the voice of Britney Spears using um, the autofill feature. Um, so this will take a second to, to load, but it's basically like the autocomplete of your, um, on your phone. Uh, so you can say, you uh, got a uh, feeling by the boys you get a feeling by the boys and then you can add punctuation and things like that if you want it starts again um counting you um counting you can hear me baby right and so you can use this just as a way to kind of create tools so you can encourage people to then hey go here and make um your own story if you want to it's just another way that this interaction and ai artificial intelligence is going to be changing uh, our version of AI in some ways. Um, cool. So that's the on-demand stuff again. So I think there's a, a big opportunity for us within the applied improv world to bring a little bit more on-demand, whether that is online courses or um, just videos of what we do. This is one of the things that I love about the AI and X talks is that it's creating some of this content in a way that's shareable. Um, the example that I give is, you know, the in terms of reach, Yes, virtual events that are live can have a great bigger reach, but also, you know, my TEDx talk has been seen uh, over 5 million times at this point. I am never, I don't think I'll ever reach 5 million people that I've, I've spoken in front of live, right? And so the impact that we can have with the messages that we're sharing, if we can create in a virtual on-demand way, it's going to reach out or going to reach to even more people. And we can incorporate applied improv as part of some of how we do that. It's not quite the same as that in-person experience or that live experience, but it is still, uh, I think, uh, of tremendous value. Uh, and if you've seen a lot of the stuff that I've done in the past, you know, I, I'm a big believer that applied improv is how. It's not what you're talking about. It's how you're talking about the cool, you know, subject matter that you are talking about. So this is just another component. Any um, questions or thoughts on the on-demand side of things? No, quick, uh, quick virtual poll by show of hands. How many of you have like videos out there on YouTube or Facebook? Couple of you, okay. Uh, how many have done um, or or have an online course or have been thinking about an online course? Okay. Uh, yeah. So again, these are other ways that we can reach different audiences and different um, focuses. Cool. Uh, so if no other questions, and we'll go on kind of to the last area, the last way that we can use this, and this is kind of the 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 bulk of of what we do, and this is where we have live. It's a live event and it is virtual in some way. Um, so it can be um, uh, live and virtual uh, in this setting. So this uh, was an event that we did in partnership with IBM around, um, the course was on networking, but it, was, it followed what um, we call a virtual classroom, but it's kind of is like the creative live model. And the creative live model was, we had some people tuning in virtually, but it was for the video. The reason why we're doing it was for the video, but we had it, uh, we had people in person for the video so that we could still do, you know, we still did directed story or color advance um, with two participants, but we demoed it with some of the people. So you can have people in person intentionally there that are more of for demoing the exercises that you're talking about. So the people at home can follow along or understand the, the rules that you're talking, uh, the rules that you're, you're suggesting or saying. And then you debrief with them what they just saw. 
And um, that way they get both experiences, not only seeing people do it, but then also the debrief of, okay, why did they do each of those individual things? Uh, the things that helped there was, again, this was in partnership with IBM. So we had a good, we had a three camera shoot. So we had one camera that was on me. We had one camera that was on the audience and we had one camera that was a wide that would be, you know, so when people got up, they would be able to see it. Uh, we also had down in the right, you see Mike, he was again, that idea of a moderator, someone in person who is taking uh, the questions um, here, kind of Lisa, to your point of like, how do you manage both is we intentionally then set up, we'd have some questions that we immediately went to, to the audience to say, okay, by, you know, show of hands, how many of you have done this? Or um, can anyone think of, you know, what, uh, why do, why do we hate networking? What is it about networking that we don't like? Um, you can ask that just of the audience in li uh, live and they, uh, sorry, in person, they see that. Or you can also set that up as like, okay, so uh, our next question is, what is it about networking that you don't like? For those of you, and then you look directly into the camera, you can say, for those of you joining virtually, go ahead and type that into the chat. Uh, we'll pull a couple of those ideas. But uh, as you're thinking of those ideas, anyone here in the room have any thoughts? So you go potentially to the room first because it's a little bit faster. And then by having a moderator, we would then go to, okay, so Mike, uh, what were some of the thoughts from the, the people online? And then he would be going through the chat to kind of say, okay, uh, these are what people are saying. Or, we, you know, multiple people are saying that they tend to, you know, it tends to be very boring. Um, or, um, you know, one person is saying that uh, they always feel awkward. Um, and, um, yeah, and then as far as exercises and debriefing, um, typically we would debrief with the people in the room, but you could also debrief with people virtually, right? You could tell after you do the exercise, you could say, okay, again, in the chat, share some of the ideas of like, what did you notice? Um, or what did you think was, was easier? Uh, Paul, you have a thought? Yeah, this, this looks like the hybrid future we've been promised. Was mm -hmm. this the finished event? Or was the recording of this the product? The um, it was a little bit of both. So the reason, so I have the recording of it. I have not turned that into a product yet. The goal is theoretically that I could. We've learned some things. So I did this again. We did it in partnership with uh, IBM, but also through a, a company called Steady Now. And Steady Now has gotten much better because one of the things that um, they it just wasn't set up correctly so when doing this particularly with the three camera shoot what we thought was happening was um that it was recording each individual stream so that in post if we wanted to be like oh you know let's go to this now and then let's go to the audience here and then let's go to the wide here um it wasn't doing that it should have it was just a setting that was a little bit different that they had to learn uh that process um but the uh, cause what we did have is someone had, we had a director basically sitting there and had a switcher. So he determined we had one feed going through, I think, I don't think it was zoom. I think it was like go to webinar or maybe IBM's technology. No, it was, um, it was a Google, um, a Google video, a Google hangouts, um, video. And so we had one person, they just had a filter where they could press a button. And it's like, okay, go in on the, the tight and then press a different button, show the audience. And so they had a director there. For my purposes, I wanted the video afterwards in the creative live style. IBM wanted to test the ability to do this completely live. And so it was dual purpose. So they wanted to say, okay, yeah, when we have these, because they're thinking about, okay, when we have these big sales events and we're bringing in, you know, all the people from North America to one place, not everyone can attend, but could they still get some of that content? And could there still be interaction? Still, can we still have polls as opposed to people just watching? And that's what we did. And we, for this particular talk, we didn't incorporate it, but for future ones, we've started to, to work with things like poll everywhere to say, okay, how do we actually even get the data from the people listening so that we can ask the question of like, on a scale of one to five, how comfortable do you feel um, you know, in your sales calls. Okay, let's do that survey now. Let's do a survey. Let's do a poll in person as well, because they're interested in, say, you know, um, the gamification of polls where, you know, there's a winner, where they're doing content where there is a not a just a get to know you type question, but more of a correctness question. So it's like, okay, of the 
uh, you know, five IBM values for modern sellers, um, which one speaks most to storytelling? And then there's a correct answer to that with a, a service like Kahoot, you can have correct answers and then you can have basically a winner both and their goal is to have it so that both the people in person, the 100 people attending live and the 500 people attending virtually participate in the same poll. And then there's one winner or say maybe five winners from all of those that they pull, whether they're in person or not, they've pulled those um, uh, people together. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? It does make sense. It's very sophisticated. Um, I'm give an example of something that's a, that was a lot simpler that I did. Yeah. That's maybe more what more AIN members are perhaps likely to start with. Yeah. So my online course is uh, making a better living with improvisation. And I had a single camera recording a morning's workshop, which was then edited down from that. Mm -hmm. So the live event was created for the benefit of those participants who showed up, but primarily to make the video. And that was, I thought, more interesting way of getting the content across than sitting in front of my own camera at home, because it has that live feel to it. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, would you maybe set up a day of shooting that you fully control to come out with a video-based online course at the end of it? Would you do that kind of hybrid thing? Just some thoughts on how we go about taking the, the next step from running our own workshops live that we're used to doing. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's a great way to create online content, especially with um, this skill set of applied improv, because a lot of times you can still get the, you can get a great aha moment from watching someone else do the activity, right? Um, and so absolutely, I think that's a great way to do it rather than just direct to camera. Because the other thing that you've done, and we haven't released any videos, we may uh, in the future, because we did a similar thing of um, about a year and a half ago of recording an in-person event. And then I followed up with uh, direct to camera stuff. You know, so filling in the gaps, you have all the video from the live workshop and then maybe you stumbled through the, you know, explanation of yes and or you, it wasn't super clear. You can then do the direct to camera. Hey, here's the setup. Here's what we did. And then, and then jump to it. Is that what you did as well? I added some PowerPoint slides that were put straight into the video version and some captioning to run a commentary as, as an additional strand of information for the viewers. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, I think you can do that in a different, in a couple of different ways because you can also then say, you know, there's nothing to say that in that version that you did that you couldn't make that a Facebook live or a YouTube live video that people could watch and then you could delete it a little bit later or that could be your finished product if you want it to. Like there is, you know, there's a lot more opportunity for some of those, those types of things. Um, it's up to you then to determine, you know, how much do you want people to be able to see um, live versus only seeing it in an in-person experience and are you, you know, I'm a big believer that um, I should be very good. I, I should hopefully be, it should kind of be like a, a, a stand-up comedian who you like a lot where you're like, okay, I've seen a bunch of their videos online, but if I still have the chance to go and see them in person, I will. Um, that's my thought because some people are like, oh, but if you put your content, uh, you know, all on video or Facebook Live, will anyone ever pay to come see you live? And I think they will, right? There is something very different about that live experience or being the one in the room doing these interactive exercises. Um, but that's my own personal take. You have to, for some people, you have to decide whether or not you want some of this content online or not. Uh, and also to recognize that, um, you know, just straight setting up a camera in the back of the room, hitting record, and then um, turning it off and then uploading that immediately with no video or no concern for audio or that kind of thing, it's not going to do you justice um, for what you're capable of. And so you do want to make sure that you're putting out a good product. Depending on who you talk to, um, I have heard from um, some bureaus um, from the speaking side of things, again, a little bit different, but from the speaking side of things, they've said that a bad video is worse than no video just because people then can see it and they're like, oh, okay, I don't want this. And so you just want to be making sure that the, the, the product that you're putting out there 
is something that you are proud of. This is again where audio comes is a huge um, factor kind of coming into play is making sure that you have good audio. Um, there's great tools where you can, there's microphones that you can plug in that directly go into your phone. So if you wanna make sure that you get good audio for video a little bit later, you uh, buy the like a lapel, have it directly go into your phone, use a voice recorder app on your phone, and that way you're recording good audio that you can then, syncing audio between two things now is a right click of a button and you click synchronize and it does it automatically for you. Um, you can also, I have a um, Zoom, um, we'll see if I can find it, I have it close. Um, I have a Zoom H1N, um, the, the Zoom series um, is a pretty popular brand of in-person audio thing. So everything that I do, I record, I set this down and record, not necessarily because I'm going to use it for later, but so I can go back and listen to uh, like how I've done and pull parts of it. But you can get one of these types of things. This I think was about a hundred bucks. The, they have more advanced ones that can plug directly into a soundboard. Um, the Zoom H4n is pretty popular, but you can kind of bring your own equipment to record some of this stuff so that you can make it video a little bit later if you want to. Um, and, and audio a lot of times is one of the big factors that uh, impacts um, things uh, in terms of how professional a video feels. You can buy a, a, you know, a GoPro or something like that, set that up on a, a stand. And uh, the nice thing is with a lot of video cameras, if you record in 4K, um, for videos online, you're typically not going to show in 4K anyway, so then you can then crop. And so if you maybe don't have the perfect frame, you can still set a 4K video that's wide, and then you can crop in um, a good amount, and it still have good quality online. Um, yeah, and, and Doug, Doug's point, yeah, if you're really interactive and, you're, and the people in the room are having a lot of fun, it might make people really want to be the live person experience, right? So you're not going to necessarily, I don't know, I'm a big believer that um, speaking leads to more speaking or training leads to more training. People experience what you do, they love it, uh, it's great, and that's going to have, that's going to send you so that more people, um, uh, it's going to say, hey, you, this was fantastic, so-and-so needs to see you, and it's going to lead to more work. So that was one environment where it was um, both live and in person. The main group focus here, though, was the um, the virtual audience. So the live people were more to demonstrate ideas. Um, another example also shared in um, uh, at Stony Brook was uh, a situation where I was in New York and the client was in Switzerland. And so what we did, same group worked with Steady Now Productions, was um, we had a camera, um, and in this picture there are nine Drews, um, uh, just in terms of the sheer number of people because we had a camera, we had a couple of things set up. Um, but uh, the big takeaways, because again, you may not work, you may not do something this you know, quote unquote sophisticated or this, like all of this technology. But the things that were really helpful for me were um, one, you can see, um, let me see if I can annotate um, so this. You can see it um, here and I need a good color. And so first here is uh, my slide. So I had a, you know, presenter view or I had a confidence monitor basically that I can use. Uh, you have the uh, camera here that was on me. This is what I was looking into the whole time. Having people in the room helps you to present as if people are in the room. Um, and then the other big thing behind um, uh, Dan's big head is this is the video feed of the audience. So we set up, we had the client set up a webcam to show the audience, and that way I could do things still like, you know, raise your hand if this. Um, I had then a moderator on the other side, like the, a person who worked at the company, and I said, okay, you're going to be kind of my, like, um, guide, my in-person kind of MC. And um, so then I would explain an exercise. So I still did activities where it's like, okay, for this next exercise, you know, pair up with the person next to you. Uh, in your pair, quickly determine who has longer hair, and then that person is going to do blank, right? Whatever two-person activity you want them to do, you're then able to kind of watch it happen, and then for the debrief, so then it's like, okay, for the debrief, I would tell the moderator, like, okay, uh, we're wrapping up now. Can you go ahead and pull them back? They would get their attention, and then um, 
I would debrief it from there. And they had a microphone that they would run and I could hear based on the audio that they set up uh, the microphone recording. So I could say, okay, uh, you know, if it's yes and versus yes, but how many of you thought yes and was easier? Okay, I can see a show of hands. Um, okay, why, why did you find yes and easier? And then someone would raise their hand, they would run to a microphone and then I could hear it. Um, so the things that I think were really helpful in this scenario were um, uh, definitely having, being able to see them so that I could kind of see smiles, I could see nods, I could see the, the hand raising and having a moderator on the other side was incredibly helpful um, because they were the ones that was kind of managing, they were, they, they were an extension of me basically in the room. Um, this was also another scenario where we had a couple of different angles. Um, so they, that camera that they're using is a very good camera. It was a 4K camera. And so they were able to, they would have either a wide on me. They could choose to zoom in if they wanted to, to make it a little bit more intimate. They could go to just my slides or they could also do picture in picture where it was a picture of me and then my slides in the corner. And then um, Joe, who is here, was basically the director deciding which shot to do. Again, you don't have to do anything that advanced, but for bigger clients, and I think as we go grow forward, you know, we might do more and more of this type of thing. The other thing that I think was really helpful that anyone can do is if you are in more of a presentation mode is standing. I think so often we think of like, oh, okay, I'm doing a webinar, so I'm gonna sit there because everyone else is kind of sitting there as well. We just know that that can kind of change some of our performance. So I think standing up and having a good background and being a little bit more playful and having flexibility to, um, to have that level of energy, I think is a, a very helpful thing when doing these types of um, uh, events. Um, let's see, checking the chat there. Oh, okay. Um, Cool. So that's the so that's one scenario, like the second scenario, right? We have the scenario where it's both live and in person. We have a scenario where it is entirely virtual, but the audience is in one spot together in a room. Uh, and then we have the scenario that is uh, maybe a little bit more traditional that we think about, where it is um, this webinar style where everyone is individually in front of their um, computer. Um, uh, one tip is learn to clear the annotations before you close that bar so they don't go from slide to slide. Um, can I do that? Clear all drawings. Okay, boom, did it. Um, so I think the other thing to keep in mind or think about with um, virtual environments is taking advantage of the fact that everyone is in front of a computer that everyone can kind of contribute in a different way. So for example, polls. Uh, so Zoom has a capability to add polls. Um, we haven't added them um, here today, but you have the ability to incorporate a poll if you want to. Again, the polls can be used one, just to get more information about the group. On a scale of one to five, how, do you, how comfortable do you feel with blank? Um, or you can use it for a correctness. Again, you can say, okay, like based on what we've talked, um, you know, uh, what are the three ways that you might, uh, the three scenarios where you might use um, uh, online tools? Uh, and then you can add people answer there. So you're checking kind of um, retention and understanding. Uh, the couple of thoughts around polls. One is if you do a poll and it theoretically is gonna impact your talk, actually have it impact your talk. So one of the pieces of feedback that we got with the PNG alumni webinar uh, group would be that uh, sometimes a presenter would start with a poll and they'd be like, how familiar are you with blank? Um, and they thought people were gonna say not familiar at all. Most people said, oh, super familiar. And then it didn't change any of their presentation. And so people are like, why did I fill out that poll if it's not gonna impact what you say? Or if you're not even gonna speak to um, what you're saying. Uh, the other thing that is helpful about a poll is that it just is another touch point for people. It's another opportunity for people to, you know, if they're in their email, the fact that you have a poll and encourage them to come back, you want them touching things. Because if they're not, they're going to get distracted and look at um, other things that are out there. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, to Paul's point, you, based on what they say, you may have to actually improvise what you're going to talk about. Um, cool. Um, you can also use the chat, so you don't have to be um, super fancy with things. You can say, hey, in the chat, um, you know, where you could type in where you're coming in from or on a scale of one to five, how comfortable are you with improv? And then you can do kind of an informal looking, oh, it's like, oh, in the chat, there's a lot of fives. 
Um, oh, and the, the group or suggestion for our story is I'm seeing this word, you know, stands out to me. So you can really take advantage of, um, of the chat. Uh, you can also do uh, drawing. So for example, if we go back into annotate, um, we can do the, I don't know the actual name of it. I don't know if any of you do the, like basically where you draw one line at a time. Does anyone know what that's called? Um, Cause you can do this in person. People sometimes do it uh, online. But uh, for example, um, if I make one line here, um, now let's say maybe Paul, do you want to make the next line and we'll do a, we'll, we'll create a drawing together. Um, so Paul, you can go next using the annotation tool. Um, you can pick a color that you would like, but use the, um, uh, maybe just use the draw tool and add an additional line. Are you able to do that? I was going to fill in and then so each of you can kind of get ready for that. So you can go into the annotation tool. Go ahead and pick the, the color that you want. I can uh, find a color to go with the draw. Uh, it should be under format. So draw is like cool. determines like the the um, width of things and then format is kind of the color and how thick the line you want it to be. Yeah, it's not going onto the page though. Oh, interesting. Is someone else able to? See a square. Is that you, Paul? Okay, there's a line in brown. Oh, I got it now. Okay. Okay, so Doug has the... Um, uh, the brown line, yes, then we have a gray, and then Lisa, if you want to add a line or something, you know, and then you can, so you can basically do, I know people have done this exercise in person, but then you can do this virtually and say, hey, let's draw something together. Or you can have people do their own individual drawings off to the side, like draw how you're, you know, feeling right now. Um, and this is just creating engagement. You want these types of touch points so that people are, again, in a virtual environment, it's much easier for them to alt tab or command tab into something else. So you want some type of uh, piece of interaction as you're um, talking about things that you just give people this ability to, to practice. Um, I like that, very cool. Um, and this is all built in, this annotation tool is uh, built in basically to Zoom. Um, what I did is in, um, um, PowerPoint, if you're sharing a PowerPoint slide, if you hit W, um, it just whites out the entire screen. You can also hit black. Um, if I, uh, let's see, close that and switch back to the slide. Uh, if you hit B, it just changes things black. Uh, if you hit white, again, it changes everything to white. And so I didn't have to create anything special for that. I just, you know, hit W on the slide. It made it basically now a whiteboard for us to play with. Um, and then I can bring this back. Cause there is also something called all A W W. Uh, I don't know the exact URL, but the, that's a, you are a website version of basically doing the same thing. Um, and then as the um, host, I can control if I want to clear just my drawings as part of it and leave your beautiful artwork up. Or I can say, uh, you know, it, uh, art is a temporary, especially in improv, it's all gone. Um, right. So then you can debrief and everything from there. Um, then we have, of course, the, uh, what we're going to do today, have the, the virtual environment uh, within Zoom. You can have quite a few people um, join at any given time so that, again, you can kind of virtually see them if you want. Um, and then you can always call on people. I think this is where the facilitation of the moderation skill comes in is within, you know, it's a little bit harder because I, I can, because everyone's like order might be a little bit different for me to be like, okay, you go next. It's hard to know who that is, but if you then have those view comes up, you can say, okay, um, uh, Doug, you're next in this area. Um, do you want to share, you know, a thought or an idea? Um, let's see. Um, what if we do that? Five minutes. What is five minutes or so? Uh, how much time we have left? Oh, my uh, audio just got uh, garbly. Is my audio okay now? Or is it still garbly? Still garbly. Hold on. Can 
new domain. Let me check that. Well, that's, that's improved just then. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, yeah, so just to, to start to uh, quickly wrap up. Um, yes, so, um, yeah, I have low system resources. Um, that's what uh, Zoom is telling me. So make sure that you clear, you know, close everything out uh, when you're starting a, a Zoom call. Uh, the last thing that we'll end on, and we can't do it today because of a uh, Zoom setting, but the wonderful thing is there is the, um, uh, there's this breakout feature. So down in the bottom right-hand corner of Zoom, when you have it set on, and it, you do have to turn it on for your um, things, so you have to make sure it's turned on in the setting, but you can create breakout rooms. And the breakout rooms then put the participants together in a virtual room with just each other. And so you can say, hey, virtually we're gonna do uh, the exercise of, um, uh, yes, but versus yes, and you click on the breakout room. You can decide, you decide, it tells you how many participants you have and then how many rooms you want to create. And then that puts, so then that determines how many you have. You can't say put two people in a room. You have to say, okay, if there are six people, create three rooms. Um, if there are, I think you can do up to 200 if you have an added um, icon. I think 50 is the, the default. So if you had 50 people and you wanted people in rooms of two, you would need to create 25 rooms um, for two each. Once you go into the room, as a participant in the room, they can ask for help, which gives you as a moderator notification, and then you can join that room if you would like to give clarification. You can also send a text chat. Uh, the text thing isn't all that visible, so you do have to kind of, um, uh, they may not see it if they're in the middle of an activity. and then. Um, the other thing is that uh, it takes about, uh, they have a, once you close the meeting rooms, it takes about 60 seconds. It gives them a 60 second warning. And so just know that when you are giving that debrief of if you're like, okay, um, you did the exercise, now start to think here, you have 60 seconds left and go. And so depending on how long you want that activity to be, um, that, de that determines when you want to actually um, uh, start the, the, timer and it brings everyone back. The other thing is that people have to opt into the room. So you click on make everyone go into breakout rooms. They then have to click on enter breakout room. Otherwise, they stay in the main window and don't see the individual thing. Uh, you can also assign breakout rooms. So if you have a smaller group and you have specific people that you want to go into specific rooms with each other, you can assign that or you can have um, Zoom do it randomly if you would like. Uh, but that's a really cool feature because that's basically the equivalent of turn to the person next to you or get into a group of three or get into a group of four. And then most activities that you do that would be verbal back and forth, you can then do um, in this Zoom environment. Um, great. So, um, yeah, and so to answer that question, um, you can assign or it can be random, entirely up to you what you want to, to do. Uh, and I'm a big believer that, you know, almost any exercise can be an applied improv exercise if you debrief it properly. So if you think about um, games that you play, like you could have uh, participants play word with friends and then debrief that, um, right? Think about the other things that are already virtual that people engage with or the Facebook challenges that you see uh, online or the other ways that you engage virtually. Think about, okay, how could I turn that into an activity? It's something that I'm already doing. Um, uh, let's see. So then to, uh, to recap, right, we have three different ways that we can bring um, uh, the virtual experience into our work, whether that is a live virtual program like we just talked about using some polling, some two-way video breakout rooms. Um, we have the on-demand experience, maybe that's video or demos for people. And then we have the live person events and we can use technology, the thing that we, we started with um, as well. Uh, as far as technology goes, these are some of the things that I referenced um, today. So I have uh, presented from a Surface Pro. It's what I travel with. Um, a lot of the recording I do with the GoPro, they just came out with the Hero 8. They also came out with a 360 version of a camera. So if you wanted to set up a camera in the middle of the room in it for it to capture everything, uh, you could do that. Um, I use my Pixel 2 for audio recording along with the Zoom H1N, which I didn't share here. And then these are some of the technologies that I talked about. The Blue Yeti microphone is the microphone that I showed earlier. Um, Botnik, you have tools like otter.ai, which is where you can upload an audio file and it will, using AI, transcribe the file. 
So if you wanted to say, oh, I did this workshop, what did I say? Or I want to turn it into a blog post. That could be your first draft of it. You can also hire a company called like rev.com where they pay basically a dollar a minute to transcribe your things. And so that could be your handout afterwards. I know people who have done workshops that then led into books. So they would do workshops to create content that created the first draft of their book. And then um, they've edited it from there. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of different ways that we can leverage technology and the things that we do. Um, uh, this link should still be live from before, but if you want a, a copy of the slides, slightly tweaked from the, the previous version, if you go to gethumor.org slash AIN 2019, uh, you should have access to be able to download those. Um, that should stay live for people watching this virtually as well. Um, so for the, the sake of time, want to, uh, to wrap up there, but hopefully this starts to give you a couple of ideas that we can use technology to bring in. Uh, I would say let's leverage the AIN um, Facebook group to have practice scenarios, have people say, hey, I really want to lead a virtual session. If you're going to get hired for a virtual group, uh, hop into the AIN group and be like, I want to practice some of these exercises and see how they go and make sure that I'm using Zoom correctly and all of that like leverage uh, let's leverage that so we can continue to, to push the mold but hopefully this is some starting ideas that uh, gets the ball rolling indeed thank you very much drew thank We've you been developing you know as part of these big topic video webinars some online game swaps and exchanges including developments of new activities that work particularly well in online environments uh, for example, one in Zoom last week with uh, Leaf and somebody from Chicago that was recorded and would be worth watching. A, a lower tech version, really, than mm -hmm. some of the things you've been talking about. But it really shows us some places that we may be able to go uh, individually mm -hmm. and collectively over time. So thank you very much indeed, Drew. Uh, this will be has been recorded and will go online as part of the AIN YouTube channel. And there's more to come with Rebecca Stockley and some others that will be announced very shortly. If anyone that's watching wants to offer a session for one of the big topics, 90-minute session like this, then please get in touch with me, paul at impro.org.uk. I'm going to end the recording and then we can all say whatever we want to say to each other <laughs> beyond the recording that nobody will ever know. Mm -hmm.